All right, welcome back to our uh, study through Ezekiel. Let's uh, begin in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you that you've given us your word. Uh, You are to be glorified by your people. You are to be known by your people. And uh, I I thank you for, Lord, that your church can see uh, perhaps when it goes down the wrong path in false worship uh, because of your word in Ezekiel. Uh, understanding uh, that we, in fact, replace true worship often with multiple means of idolatry. So help us today understand the form of idolatry that you're talking about in Ezekiel chapter 17. We seek this not just to have knowledge, Lord, but to worship you rightly, to glorify you, to exalt you as our God. We thank you for all that you have done through Jesus Christ in restoring us. Now restore us and create us again. Renew our minds in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in Ezekiel chapter 17. Let's go ahead and read the passage. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, propound a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. Say, thus says the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumage of many colors, came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. He broke off the topmost of its young twigs and carried it to a land of trade and set it in a city of merchants. Then he took of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. He set it like a willow twig, and it sprouted and became a low-spreading vine, and its branches turned toward him and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out boughs. And there was another great eagle with great wings and much plumage. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him from the bed where it was planted, that he might water it. It had been planted on good soil by abundant waters, that it might produce branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. Say, Thus says the Lord God, Will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers, so that all its fresh sprouting leaves wither? It will not take a strong arm or many people to pull it from its roots. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind strikes it, wither away on the bed where it sprouted? Then the word of the Lord came to me, Say now to the rebellious house, Do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took her king and her princes and brought them to him to Babylon. And he took one of the royal offspring and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath, the chief men of the land he had taken away, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up and keep his covenant that it might stand. But he rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and a large army. Will he thrive? Can one escape who does such things? Can he break the covenant and yet escape? As I live, declares the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells who made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant with him he broke, in Babylon he shall die. Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company will not help him in war, when mounds are cast up and siege walls built to cut off many lives. He despised the oath in breaking the covenant, and behold, he gave his hand and did all these things. He shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, As I live, surely it is my oath that he despised, and my covenant that he broke. I will return it upon his head. I will spread my net over him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him there for the treachery he has committed against me. And all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword, and the survivors shall be scattered to every wind, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar, and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird 
In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. Okay. So uh, the passage, as you can see, is, uh, be- begins with a parable. And there's a parable really about these two eagles. The first eagle, he goes to the top of a cedar in Lebanon. Lebanon is where these giant cedars grow. And so and he takes just the top of this cedar and he, he plants it somewhere uh, in good soil, nice, nice ground, water around it, that sort of thing, to where it's, it's still going to survive. Uh, the second eagle uh, comes along and he doesn't really do anything to the, the, uh, the branches, but if you notice, the, uh, the seedling starts growing its roots up toward the eagle rather than in the soil in which it was planted. And it's like reaching out toward the eagle as though the eagle grabbing it would somehow save it. And uh, he asks the question then in this whole parable, is that going to survive? Is it going to survive by growing its roots up toward this eagle, thinking that somehow this eagle will save it? Now, you might ask, what is all this talking about? Like, what what's with the eagle and grabbing this and that and the other thing and then the other eagle that it's reaching out toward for help and all of that. Well, the, the passage is really set up in a chiastic form to where you have the, the parable on one side, but you can also then lay out the text and it's almost just absolutely parallel in understanding what each thing is in the interpretive section. So after he gets, he gets done with this whole, uh, you know, the eagle thing, In verse 11, he says, Then the Lord's message came to me, Say to the rebellious house of Israel, Don't you know what these things mean? Say, see here, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem. So when you lay these texts out side by side, the eagle, the first eagle, is actually the king of Babylon. Now, you also get the idea that it's God through the king of Babylon who's kind of doing this to them, and that's kind of been the message of Ezekiel as well, but, uh, but the eagle itself is the king of Babylon. He took one from the royal family, made a treasury with him, put him under oath. He then took the leaders of the land so it would be a lowly kingdom that could not rise on its own, but had to keep its treasury with him in order to stand. But this one from Israel's royal family rebelled against the king of Babylon by sending his emissaries to Egypt to obtain horses and a large army. Will he prosper? Will the one doing these things escape? Can he break the covenant and escape? So when you put all these things parallel, the second eagle is actually Egypt. Um, and then the question, will it, pro- uh, will it survive, is will he escape? And, it, and these things are par- parallel. So what has happened is essentially uh, Israel, Judah, did not want to remain under the king of Babylon anymore, even though they could have prospered where they were. They would have been a huge nation, but God was disciplining them by, uh, by their idolatry and put the king of Babylon over them. Instead of trusting what God had placed under them through the king of Babylon, through Nebuchadnezzar, they wanted to obtain an army from Egypt, get help from Egypt, in order to get free from Nebuchadnezzar. Now, years before, they had already done this with, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, trying to get free from their enemies by inviting Babylon in. Uh, they did it before, with northern Israel did it before with Assyria, um, trying to get help from Assyria <clears throat> in, order to fight, um, in order to fight Syria. So this is a common thing that Israel had done. Now, something you need to understand is this is a constant complaint that God has against the people, that they reach out to foreign nations in order to obtain victory from other worldly nations. And um, this is important. We're going to come back to this. But ultimately, what we see here is that, as we've seen through Ezekiel, different kinds of idolatry this is yet another form of idolatry. So as we've gone along, we've seen idolatry manifest first and foremost in literal idolatry, literally having idols in the temple 
and whatnot, but also by distorting God. And that's why God keeps saying, I am Yahweh and, and is presenting himself accurately as the God of wrath and mercy together rather than a distortion of who he is. Um, but also idols of the mind. If you remember, we talked about that, the idols of the mind. The idolatry comes in more than just this literal way but instead in all sorts of other ways. And of course, the biggest idol is the self. And we've seen that in their complaints against God because they think that they're getting the short end of the stick, that God should somehow give them what they want. And when they don't, they complain against him. And so constant complaints throughout that God is being unjust to them. He's not giving them what their rightful due is as his people, all of that sort of thing. Idolatry takes many forms. In chapter 17, it takes the form of uh, trying to gain victory over the world through worldly means. So they're trying to become free from the world by appealing to the world. It's free from Nebuchadnezzar uh, by using Egypt. Uh, rather than appealing to God to ask God to free them and to worship God through the means God has provided and to live through the means God has provided, even if it means living under Nebuchadnezzar for a while, rather than do that, they want victory and victory doesn't look like what God has given them here and now. And so they're going to essentially rely upon worship something else. They're going to get their victory through a different means than what God has provided. And in doing so, they show that Egypt is the God that they're appealing to. Egypt is the God they're trusting in to obtain that victory, not Yahweh. Now, here's a very important lesson for us. We are not physical Israel as the church. We are spiritual Israel. So we're not looking to wage physical wars. We're waging a spiritual war. Our, our, what our victory looks like isn't uh, we're free from some sort of oppressive government or something. The war we're waging is spiritual. It's against the wickedness of the world. It's against the captivity of God's people um, by the world. And... Victory then has to be obtained through a different means. What means is the church given to free themselves from the world? What means are they given to free other people in the world from the world? Well, isn't it the Great Commission? Go into all nations, making disciples, baptizing them. How do you make disciples? What's the means? by which we make disciples. Baptizing them, that is you preach the gospel and you have them commit to Christ. Teaching them all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, very important, that's the means God has provided toward victory. What is the church doing? What has the church done since the Enlightenment and the new measures of Finney? Is, hasn't it been using a different means? How do we evangelize people? Is it through altar calls? Notice, that's not the means in the Great Commission by which we obtain victory and we free people from the dominion of the world. It is through the gospel and it is through the whole counsel of God uh, through what Jesus Christ taught. Everything. It is not through gimmicks. It's not through carnival-like atmospheres. It's not through entertainment. Those are worldly means to free people from the world. Well, guess what? When you use worldly means to free people from the world, you're not freeing them from the world. You're simply moving them from one part of the world to dominion uh, under the world in another. The, 
the means that are essentially being used are emotional means. Now, read the Great Commission. Do you see anything about using emotion there? Baptize them, preaching the gospel to them. Baptize them. Teaching them all that Christ commanded. And Christ, through the Spirit, is in the Word to transform people and bring victory. Where is there anything about riding motorcycles on stage? Where is there anything about playing secular music that resonates with people because you can really pull their strings with it? Where is there anything about telling sentimental stories and these sensationalistic testimonies that, yes, I was once a mass murdering Satanist and now Jesus saved me and that's how somehow going to save people? You are using a manipulative tactic that the world uses to make false Christians. That is idolatry. You are relying upon your own cleverness and the cleverness of the world to get people into its various groups, to get people into the church. You are commanded. God has one means by which you are to worship him and obtain victory in this war that we are waging. It is the gospel and the word of God. The, the word of God as the, and the gospel at the center. It's the word of God by which God creates. From the very beginning in Genesis 1, how does God create? That you have chaos, the world is in chaos, it's in disorder, and the spirit of God hovers over the waters, and what's the Spirit going to do? He's going to apply the Word of God to whatever God says. So let there be light, boom, there's light. Word, divine fiat. That's how God creates. That's how he creates life. That's how he orders the world. That's how he creates life and orders an individual who's in the world, who is chaos, who is a son of the devil. That's how you free them. You don't free them with emotional music and altar calls. Why do you go to church? Do you go to church because you like the entertainment? Do you go to church because of the music? And I don't care if it's like modern music, um, if it, you know, it's re whether it have like rap or electric guitars, although that's not really modern anymore. Um, I don't care like what kind of music it is, or it's old carnival music that I always make fun of, the, the carousel music that the gospel songs of the early uh, 20th century and late 19th century had. It sounds like you're at a carnival, right? I don't care if you're an older person who likes that music, a younger person who likes the other music. At the end of the day, that's not why you go to church. If that's why you go to church, you're a false Christian, let me tell you why real Christians go to church. They go to church to meet with God through his word and fellowship with his people through his word. Because that's the means by which the, they are freed from the world. And it's the means by which those who are still lost are freed from the world. You are relying upon Egypt. You are using worldly tactics and gimmicks to somehow save people from the world. You're not. You're making natural Christians, and a natural Christian is a false Christian. You're not teaching the full counsel of God. You're not teaching all that Christ commanded so that when the real church comes along to these fake Christians that you've made, they don't know how to respond to it. So they're just like, that's not my Jesus. It's utterly fascinating that it's not your Jesus, and yet it's what Jesus communicated is him in the Bible. It's how Jesus presented himself. It's the words of Jesus, and yet they cannot tolerate it because they never were transformed 
through the means that God gave you to transform them because you weren't worshiping God in your gospel message, quote unquote. You're not worshiping God in your preaching. You're not worshiping God in your music, in your service. It's a show for the people rather than a worship uh, ceremony for God. And so it is idolatry. You need to understand this. This is not just a one-time thing God says. He says it throughout the prophets. This is a form of idolatry when you use the world to try to get free from the world rather than you appealing to God and listening to God and speaking God's words and obeying God. Of course your churches are going to be filled. You're simply moving someone who worships himself with, let's say, cars and money, who's now going to worship himself through your religion, a religion, a sentimental religion of emotion and stories and, and, and sentimental music. So what? You've, you've simply moved the self-worshipper from here to here. All, all they're doing here, all Israel would be doing is moving from being under the Babylonians to being under Egypt. Neither one of those is the kingdom of God. Now, this is true whenever you use an alternate means to transform the world at, at all. And this is very important. Uh, this same thing I've, I've just said about these churches who do this, I would say about people at abortion clinics. Look, if, if you think somehow you're going to transform people by like law alone and not gospel, by just telling them that they're murdering their babies, I mean, that might shock people. You might get people to save their babies for that temporary period. You're not saving their babies, though, because everybody's still going to hell. Everybody's still living in a manner that's contrary to God. Everybody's still living in chaos and doing chaos in the world. You may have actually saved the next Hitler. Congratulations. Our goal is not save the world so it can be the world on a different day. Our goal is to save people through the means Christ commanded us to use. Preaching the gospel baptizing them, uh, teaching them all that he commanded. And through that, he's with us to the end of the age. Through that, and that means only. You want to know why the altar call replaced baptism? Not in the sense that people who do altar calls, they don't later baptize people, but as the marking point of when you really become a Christian. You want to know why that replaced it? Because Finney and all the, the, the uh, gimmicks of the Great Awakening and all that we have today and all this big show that we have, you get people emotionally pumped up. You either get it very sentimental and you make them sad in some way and, and, and get them to be emotional so that they're crying, or you get them really excited and pumped up. Either way, it's in the moment, in the emotion of the moment, and so right away you have them come to the altar. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been cases in church history. There have been cases, uh, you know, in the Bible with like uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch where there's water right away. But usually, usually baptism has to take place later because there's not water right away. It gives the person time to think about whether or not they're going to follow Christ. Christ makes the statement, who builds a tower and doesn't first consider whether he can finish it? Who, what king goes out to war without first thinking about whether he can defeat the other army. And after he makes that statement, he says, therefore, look, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Think about following Jesus and then do it. Baptism allows you a little bit of time to think about it. It's not in an emotional decision. It's not an emotional frenzy that you're in that you then uh, commit yourself to Christ real quick. 
But you can actually think about it, think about what Christianity is saying, think about what Christ is commanding you to do, and then say, yes, I'm going to commit to Christ. That's what baptism allows you to do, because there's some delay, usually. Altar calls don't. It's immediate in the moment. Get everybody very emotional, get them to the altar, boom, have them pray that prayer. Do you see anything about praying prayers in the Great Commission? See anything about some sort of magical prayer that you pray or coming forward and that's, that's what your commitment is? No. Again, the means of emotion, you want to you see that in religion, it's not going to be in Christianity. The, using the means of emotion to worship gods and to pull people this way or that way is paganism. You are partaking, again, in a false form of worship. Because you're using this pagan means. And you think it's going to accomplish something for God. It's not. You're actually working against God. So congratulations, you've built giant churches, quote-unquote churches, that now the real churches have to fight against. Because every time we come into contact with one of your people, your supposed Christians that you made, we have to actually evangelize them again. And now it's harder to do because they already think they're Christians. And they have this absolute resistance toward the real God and the real Jesus Christ and what he actually taught because they think they've already become Christians because they heard your sentimental stories and they love your music and they just love your preacher because he's very polished and he looks great with all the makeup on. And all of that is Christianity to them and that's what they've already signed on for. So when they actually come up against the real Jesus, they have no problem in rejecting him because they think they've already received the real Jesus and it's actually your fake Jesus that you gave them. When you rely on the means of the world, you don't expand the kingdom of God. You expand the world. That's what they're doing here. You know, it's, it's nerdy to say, but I mean, if you can't, can't catch the nerdiness already, then you've, you've missed it. I'm going to be nerdy today, and I'm going to quote... Elrond, who's talking to Gimli, who tries to destroy the ring, right? And what does he say to Gimli? The ring cannot be undone by any weapon we here possess. We cannot undo the wickedness of the world, the captivity of the world, the, the bound of the world, the, the, the shackles of the world, with anything that we have in the world. It is a supernatural thing that God creates through his word. And so the gospel breaks those chains. The word of God, as it renews the mind of his people, break those chains. We cannot break them. Nothing in the world can break them. Nothing can bring to life what is dead, but the word of God can. The spirit of God, the presence of Christ through the spirit, bringing forth life out of death. All you're doing is you're gathering the dead through your worldly means and saying, look at how much life God has given to us. And yet you're all a bunch of corpses. Now, here's the hope. The hope is not in ourselves. The hope is that God will have his people. He will have his word preached. He will have his remnant. And through them, call back his people to himself so that he accomplishes their life. He accomplishes the establishment of themselves in him. And so he will do it even though we have failed to join him. Verse 22, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and plant it. I will pluck from the top one of its tender twigs. 
I myself, that's a knee, it's emphatic. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. I will plant it on a high mountain of Israel. And it will raise branches and produce fruit and become a beautiful cedar. Every bird will live under it. Every winged creature will live in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will know that I am Yahweh. Notice again, making himself known. I make the high tree low. I raise it up the low tree. I make the green tree wither. I make the dry tree sprout. I, Yahweh, have spoken it, and I will do it. Notice that. It's not you. It's God doing it. It's not your responsibility to change people or get this large group because you think it's successful to have a large group and a large building and have a lot of people. It's God's responsibility. Your responsibility is to join him as his image and speak his word. Use the means that he gave you to be transformative. He will transform through that means. You're not the one doing it. You're not the one convincing with all your logic. You're not the one convincing with all your stories. You're not the one convincing with all your entertaining and sentimental uh, gimmicks. You're not convincing at all. Not toward life. Again, you may transfer them from one cult to another, but you're not actually transferring them into the kingdom of God. God alone does that. And that takes faith on your part. It means that if you teach all that Jesus commanded, you're going to get the same ministry Jesus got. You know what that means? It means a lot of people hating their sin and repenting. And it means also a lot of people hating you. And hating your ministry. Because that's what they did with Jesus. And they're his words, not yours. So you're going to get the same response. You're going to see life created and you're going to see the foulness of the evil just stay hardened in its evil. And you'll lose members that way. And you'll probably go down from a big church to a smaller one. And that's okay. Jesus went down from a big church to a smaller one. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? And then he makes some statements They don't like them. They're offended by them. And it whittles down to the disciples. And everybody else is gone. Worst megachurch preacher in the history of megachurches. Loses all of them. And yet Jesus is fully faithful to the mission of God. And he does not lose a single one that God has called him to get. He's losing all the fake Christians. He doesn't want more fake Christians in the kingdom. They're in the way. Jesus isn't pleading for them to come to him. Oh, please just accept me. No, he's telling them, no, you should consider about following me. Because I only want you if you're going to follow me all the way. And it's God who accomplishes it, not us. Because it's God who gets the glory at the end of the day, not your gimmick. If you save people, quote unquote, you have people come in the kingdom because of your gimmick, what gets the glory? The idol of your gimmick. If you save people through emotional heartstrings, what gets the glory? Your manipulation through emotion. You get the glory. If you save people by your logic, who gets the glory? Well, your logic and and again, you. You. And what I actually fear is that what's happening is that you preachers who do this have really replaced God not only with gimmicks, but actually with yourself. You're getting the glory. How brilliant you are that you got this many people to come to church. I mean, you're, you're just a genius. God's really using you. Aren't you, aren't you a great prophet? And yet... You've ignored the means God's given you to use, and you're using the world, which God rejects. And you become a friend of the world, and you think by speaking nicely to the world, that actually gets more people. 
And you think by being a social justice warrior will somehow endear the world to you. But the world hates your guts just the same. As soon as you speak the real gospel, all that ends. You're not going to convince the world by being a nice guy. You're not going to convince the world by being super smart. You're not going to convince the world by, you know, tugging on their heartstrings. All you're doing is shuffling the world around. It's God who transforms it through his word. So my appeal to you is stop wasting your life with a different message. Stop wasting your life and your ministry. You have a short time and you've already wasted a lot of it. Repent. Turn away from this garbage. Turn away from the idolatry of the world and its, its means of uh, getting people into its own kingdoms. And turn away from the idolatry of yourself. Speak God's word. Worship him. Tell others to worship him by preaching the whole counsel of God, all that Christ commanded, and his gospel that he gave you. That is the message Ezekiel 17 has for us. Again, we are spiritual Israel. We don't have the physical means. It would be wrong to somehow take this and say, well, the United States shouldn't you know, ally itself with Europe. Or That's not the point. The point is that Israel is worshiping an idol through another means. It's worshiping a nation rather than God. It's worshiping the world rather than God. It's worshiping worldly means rather than the means God gave them of his word. So uh, chapter 17, they're, of course, going to continue to complain as they have before. We're going to see that in 18. That's yet another form of idolatry we talked about before. It's self-worship. But Ezekiel is really rebuking our idols. And this is yet again another idol so that we understand that the church is doing this is in serious disobedience and probably not a church if it continues in unrepentant disobedience this way. They're not just another flavor of Christianity. They really are a pagan religion. They're, they have the horns of the lamb like in Revelation. So they, the authority of the lamb, they come in his name and his authority and yet they speak like a dragon. Beware. And if you are one of these churches, repent. Let's go to the word of God. Let's go to God in, in prayer. Father, I pray for these churches that you would open their eyes to understand that what they're doing is in fact idolatry. And what has been practiced largely since the Great Awakening in America is in fact idolatry. It is now spread across the globe using gimmicks and music and all sorts of different means other than preaching the whole counsel of God to somehow make your people for you when in fact it is you who create the people through your word and through your word alone as the spirit applies to them. Lord, we pray that at the end of the day, people will understand that what you use to uh, take the shackles off of people in the world gives glory to that thing. And yet we are commanded to give glory to you, understanding that it's you who does this through your word. And we are just mouthpieces of your word. No glory comes to us then. No glory comes to a gimmick. No glory comes to any worldly means or the world itself, but all glory goes to you and to you alone. Lord, we pray today that all would give you glory, all would turn from this idolatrous sin and praise your name as you seek to call your people out of the world and into your kingdom. May you be blessed forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen.